Okay, welcome to EC203. Uh, this is the first lecture that we're going to get into, you know, kind of more uh, uh, concrete circuits details. Uh, the previous lecture we discussed, you know, uh, how to derive subthreshold conduction in MOSFETs from very basic principles of Boltzmann physics and so on. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to use the formulas that we created in, in, in the previous lecture, and we'll actually expand on them a little bit. And then we're going to go over some basic building blocks in uh, CMOS using MOSFET uh, transistors. Uh, so that's uh, basically what we're going to try and cover today. So uh, in this course, we're going to try and keep uh, as best as we can to the IEEE uh, convention um, for notation. Uh, and uh, that specific convention we're going to do is when we use lowercase, uh, you know, main variable, uh, uppercase subscript, this is uh, referencing both the DC and the AC components. This is equal to the DC component plus the AC component. Okay, so the DC component is going to be in all uh, capital letters for both the main variable and the subscripts whereas the uh, AC component is going to be in all lowercase letters. Okay, so that's just, uh, we'll try and keep to that. Uh, you know, many engineers are lazy and, and, and there's no consistency at all uh, between um, uh, different textbooks and so on, but uh, this is officially the IEEE convention and we'll try our best uh, to uh, abide by that. Okay, so um, before we kind of get started into small signal modeling, um, I just want to uh, briefly uh, review the subthreshold conduction equation. Uh, and in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to expand it uh, just a little bit uh, in order to provide a little bit more detail. So we're going to say that in subthreshold, IDS, the drain to source current, this includes both the DC and the AC components, uh, is equal to I off, uh, which is the current uh, when uh, the device is just totally off, times E to the, and this is a big um, thing up here, VGS plus eta times VDS minus VDD um, all over N phi T. Okay, and all of this is times one minus E to the minus VDS over phi T, all times one plus lambda VDS. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, uh, parameters here. Let's define some of these, I off, uh, this is equal to the current in the device when VGS is equal to zero and VDS is equal to the supply voltage set by the circuit, which is equal to VDD. Now this uh, parameter depends on many different things. It depends on the W over L ratio of the transistor. It depends on the thermal voltage phi T. It depends on mu. C aux, it depends on the threshold voltage in the exponential form, it's uh, minus VT over N phi T, uh, et cetera. Okay, so some students get uh, confused when, it, when they see the subthreshold conduction because there's no W over L in it, and they say, oh, well, subthreshold conduction doesn't depend on the width of the device, which of course doesn't make any intuitive sense. Um, uh, and so the reason or the way to explain this is that it actually is in the formula, but it's embedded within the I off parameter. Okay, eta, uh, this is the drain induced barrier lowering coefficient or the Dibble coefficient. Okay, um, and lambda is the usual channel length modulation uh, coefficient. Oh, sorry, channel length modulation. Uh, same thing that you've learned in your uh, previous uh, uh, courses on circuits. So now given that we have uh, this slightly more elaborate uh, version of the subthreshold equation, what I'd like to do now is develop a small signal model. And uh, you all, I'm sure, know the small signal model for above threshold. Um, but uh, the transconductance and so on is gonna be a little bit different when we're in subthreshold. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and do this carefully uh, for the subthreshold uh, version of the transistor. 
Now, you know, some of your courses may have done this before, but the, there is a kind of a very, uh, um, you know, a methodological, methodological way to create the small signal model. And what we basically do is linearize the subthreshold. Again, I'm going to write sub VT, but I'm saying in my mind subthreshold equation at a DC operating point. Okay, so uh, what we can do basically is, is draw our transistor. Uh, in this case, we'll uh, draw it as a NMOS transistor. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a AC voltage source on top of a DC voltage source. This is capital V, capital GS, little case V, little GS here. Uh, in this particular example, we're going to keep the source grounded. We have the bulk terminal that we shouldn't ever forget about. Uh, it's always there um, and very important, particularly in a bulk CMOS process. VBS and little VBS. Uh, and on top, we have a VDS source that we're going to add here. And, and you know, you would never run a circuit like this, otherwise it, the circuit isn't all that useful. Uh, this is just for characterization purposes. And we say that the current running through here is the DC current IDS plus little IDS representing the AC current, okay? So what we say then is that IDS, the small signal current flowing through the device uh, is going to be equal to the derivative of the full current, uh, little IDS sub, or sorry, little i subscript capital I capital DS divided by, or the derivative of that taken with respect to VGS, multiplied by the AC component of VGS, plus the derivative of IDS with respect to VBS. Uh, multiplied by the AC component at VBS plus, as you can guess, the derivative of IDS with respect to VDS uh, multiplied by the um, uh, AC component at the drain to source voltage. So this derivative here is what we're going to call the transconductance of the device or GM. You should be familiar with this at least in above threshold. Uh, this parameter here is what we call GMB. It's the transconductance, but from the, the bulk terminal rather than the uh, gate terminal. Uh, and then this parameter here is what we would call GDS to keep the terminology consistent. Uh, sometimes it's also called 1 over R0. Um, and, and, and this is uh, usually R0 is actually associated only with the channel length modulation. It turns out that if we're not purely in the saturation mode, there is, um, you know, a finite GDS there, even if we neglect channel length modulation. Uh, but we'll get into those level of details shortly. Okay, so let's take a, a, a closer look at the gate terminal uh, modeling GM. Okay, this is uh, obviously the most important one, uh, one that we will spend a lot of time thinking about uh, throughout this uh, course. Okay, so let's first start by looking at what this looks like in subthreshold. Okay, in subthreshold, GM is equal to the derivative with respect to VGS of the entire subthreshold equation, which again, I'll just repeat here for, for clarity, I off times E to the VGS over N phi T times e to the eta times vds minus vdd over n phi t. I just separated those two terms to make things a little easier, times 1 minus e to the minus vds over phi t. Okay, I'm going to uh, ignore uh, channel length modulation just for, for, for the purposes here. Okay, so if you take the derivative of this whole expression with, ex with respect to VGS, there's only one term in here that actually has a VGS in it. That's this term here. Uh, and so when we take the derivative, we basically get the same equation, uh, but with the 1 over n phi t falling out from the, uh, from the exponent in that uh, exponential function there. Uh, and so our transconductance, we basically say, is just equal to IDS, you know, the same drain to source current we had before, but now divided by n phi t, okay? So um, that is the transconductance uh, of a MOSFET in the subthreshold regime, at least to, to the first order approximation, okay? So this is very easy. Uh, let's write a few notes here. So note number one, 
this is actually very similar to a BJT. Um, if you recall uh, from your early courses, the transconductance of a BJT is the collector current divided by the thermal voltage. Okay, uh, the only difference is we have this factor of N in there, which means, unfortunately, that a MOSFET is slightly worse uh, than a BJT. Um, and the, the reason is because of that subthreshold coefficient. We don't uh, invert the channel perfectly, uh, or rather in subthreshold, we're not inverting the channel, but we don't have a perfect control over the channel uh, through the, the capacitive coupling. Uh, and therefore, um, we don't get quite as strong control over the transconductance as we would get in a BJT where that factor of N is not present or equivalently N is equal to one uh, for a BJT. Now, the other note that's of particular interest to us here is that GM depends only on DC current flowing through the device, okay? That's actually very attractive. Um, that makes setting up the bias for your uh, BJT, or rather, sorry, for your MOSFET uh, to be quite straightforward. Okay, so let's contrast this to what the um, transconductance looks like in above threshold. Okay, so again, the definition in above threshold is the same thing. You take the derivative of the drain to source current uh, with respect to VGS. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to write down the answer, um, but uh, the, the math is, is still fairly straightforward. It's equal to ID. Uh, sat, which is just the saturated drain to source current, divided by one half VGS minus VT. Um, so this is effectively assuming the uh, square law um, uh, mode of operation in above threshold uh, in saturation. So uh, we define, uh, a lot of people like to make this definition, VOV or the overdrive voltage. This is equal to VGS minus VT or how much in above threshold we are. Uh, and then we can say that the uh, transconductance in above threshold is ID sat divided by, sorry, it's 2 ID sat over VOV. Okay, so at first glance, we say, yeah, okay, that's the same as in subthreshold. It's also depending only on the DC current. But that's not quite true because the DC current depends on VGS, or in other words, it depends on the overdrive voltage, which is in the denominator. So if you change the numerator, the de denominator by definition has to change, okay, unless you kind of compensate with the W over L ratio. Um, so what you can do is you can go ahead and substitute in for VOV the, um, the transistor current expression uh, and uh, you know, simplify, and you'll end up getting the following expression. It's 2 ID sat times uh, mu C ox over N, N is that subthreshold parameter, times W over L. Okay, um, and so normally most textbooks don't include that factor of N, but uh, it's slightly more accurate uh, to, to include that in the expression. So what this says now is that in above threshold, and maybe let me box this one too. It's, it's not the kind of the usual form that we see the transconductance, but I think it is more useful to, to, to look at because now as we change the current flowing through the transistor, we can directly tell what the effect on the transconductance is. Um, it's a square root uh, based effect. So what we can then do is define a parameter called transconductance, transconductance efficiency. Um, as GM over ID. Okay, or in other words, how much bang for your buck do you get? How much transconductance per unit of bias current do you get in your device? Okay, given this definition, we can go ahead and plot uh, what this should look like. So let's plot IDS and then let's plot GM over IDS. Um, and let's see what this, uh, what this uh, plot looks like. So what we can say is that in subthreshold, we say that if we if we take GM, 
which is just equal to id over n phi t, and we divide by id, then all we get is 1 over n phi t, which has no bearing on what ids is, right? So in subthreshold, we say that at least to a first order, our transconductance efficiency is equal to 1 over n phi t, or in other words, it's constant, okay? Now, in above threshold, we know that GM is proportional to the square root of ID. So if we take that expression and we divide by ID, then we get something that is proportional to 1 over the square root of ID. Okay, so this is proportional to 1 over IDS. Technically, ID, ID, ID sat in above threshold. And so we say that below here, we are in the sub threshold regime. Again, I'm writing sub VT. I, I'm saying in my mind sub threshold and the above threshold regime is, you know, above some critical current here. Okay. So the lesson we can tell ourselves here is that sub threshold operation has greater transconductance efficiency than in above threshold, okay? And so that's really important. If you want to get the most bang for your buck, you want to get the most transconductance, which is an important parameter for, you know, gain and, and so on of amplifiers, then you're actually better off doing this in subthreshold. OK, you will burn less power to get that same amount of transconductance. OK, so, of course, there's no free lunch. Uh, and what we mean by that is in order to be in subthreshold for the same amount of bias current, you're going to need a much wider device. Your double W over L ratio has to be wider. And that has negative consequences in terms of input capacitance and output capacitance. Or in other words, the circuits are probably going to have lower bandwidth or be a little slower. OK, so if you can live with a slightly slower circuit or higher input capacitance and so on, then biasing your circuit in subthreshold will give you better transconductance efficiency. Uh, and that's usually something desirable uh, in low power biomedical integrated circuits applications. OK, so so far we've looked at the gate terminal. Let's go ahead and look at the other terminals now. So let's look at the body terminal. Uh, which sets the GMB uh, body terminal transconductance. Okay, so let's go through that same exercise that we did before. Let's start uh, with the subthreshold expression. Uh, again, in subthreshold, GMB is just equal to the derivative of IDS with respect to VBS. Um, which is, you know, kind of a, actually a, a weird derivative to take. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things um, that we'll say are independent of VBS multiplied by the derivative with respect to VBS of E to the minus VT over N phi T. OK, so I actually pulled this part out of the I off expression. OK, so this is part of I off because um, it's really the only part that that depends on um, the bulk uh, voltage uh, in this particular expression. OK, so if we go ahead and do that derivative, um, uh, at least that this first part of the derivative, we're going to get minus IDS over N phi T. That's not a very good phi symbol. Let me try that again over n phi t. There we go. Times the derivative of vt with respect to vbs. OK, um, so, you know, you, we can write out the body effect expression and so on. And uh, as it turns out, we'll kind of skip a few steps here. But the answer is we get something that's n minus 1 times ids over n phi t. Uh, or in other words, it's just equal to n minus 1 times gm, the regular gate-based transconductance. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that the back gate, you know, really does work as a back gate. The bulk is, is, is truly a back gate. Um, so we can say that thus the back gate, 
uh, you know, most people call it the bulk, but we can call it a back gate, does work as a transconductor, but has slightly worse uh, transconductance than the regular gate or the front gate. Uh, the reason this is true is it's equal to n minus 1 gm. n is usually in CMOS something like 1.4, 1.5, or something like this. So basically you're getting you know, 1.4 minus 1 or, or about 50% uh, or so of the transconductance of, of the regular gate. Um, so despite being a little bit worse, it can, however, uh, still be a useful third, uh, fourth terminal. Um, you know, most people, when they draw their transistors, they don't even bother to show the bulk. Um, but, you know, actually, according to this analysis, it can actually be a useful uh, fourth terminal. Okay, so let's go ahead and now do the analysis in above threshold. Uh, GMB is going to be equal to that same derivative we showed above and skipping a few steps. Punchline is, well, it's it's the same thing, okay? Um, so it's n minus 1 times gm. However, note that in this case, this is not the sub-threshold gm, but rather this is the above-threshold gm. Um, and likewise, in the sub-threshold expression, that is the sub-threshold gm. We have to compare uh, apples to apples. Okay, moving on. Let's go on to the drain terminal. to compute GDS. Okay, now um, up to now, we've assumed that IDS is proportional to W over L. In reality, Things are always a little bit more complicated than, than our simple first order equations indicate. IDS is proportional to W over capital L minus little l p, okay, where l p is the length of depletion region that depends on VDS. Um, and effectively, this is due to channel length modulation. OK, so we can uh, draw this pictorially. This is uh, effectively going to be the same sort of thing that you've seen before in your textbooks. So if we draw VDS versus IDS, this curve uh, should look something like this, and then it just totally saturates um, after some, some level in sub-threshold. Um, we're saying that uh, level should be something like four phi t, basically whenever that second exponential uh, in the sub-threshold equation uh, effectively goes to zero, um, then, then our, our device we consider to be saturated. So four phi t is about 100 millivolts or so at room temperature. Now, that's in theory according to our first order equations. In reality, we don't get quite something like that. The, the linear region is, is pretty similar here, but in the so-called saturated region, we do have a finite slope. And so just like in above threshold and sub threshold, the same thing happens. We can um, kind of find out where this intercept point uh, would be. Uh, this is called the early voltage uh, labeled here as negative VA. Okay, so VA uh, is equal to 1 over lambda, which is called the early voltage. It's not uh, the early voltage because it came early or something. It, it happens to be named after a gentleman by the name of early. Okay, so uh, for rough estimations, 
we can set IDS prime to be equal to IDS times one plus lambda VDS. Okay, um, so then, and that effectively uh, includes this uh, channel length modulation effect uh, for both above threshold and subthreshold, we say that GDS is equal to IDS over VA, which is just equal to lambda IDS, or other words, equal to one over R naught. Okay, so let me box this. And I should say that this is in saturation only. Okay, it turns out that even so, even if we were to eliminate uh, channel length modulation from our model, we actually would still get some finite GDS, not in the saturation region, of course, but uh, in the in the linear region. And we can perhaps derive that uh, some other time. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is take this small signal model and put it all together. Putting it all together. Okay, so the outcome of this is uh, basically we're gonna end up using uh, what we call the pi model uh, for our transistor. This should be uh, very similar, uh, familiar to you. Uh, nothing has is different relative to uh, what exists in above threshold. Uh, everything is uh, effectively the same thing here. So we have our GM uh, generator. We have our GMB VBS generator over here. That's a dependent current source. We have our uh, GDS or our R naught resistor here. This is VD. This uh, here is VS. And of course, we should always draw the the bulk terminal there, um, just to make sure that we we understand that you know it exists there. Okay, so. Um, what I'd like to do now is I want to switch over to uh, another topic that's important for us to study before moving on to basic building blocks is small signal capacitance. We have to make sure that we understand how to model this uh, correctly uh, to make sure that you know we understand the trade-offs between subthreshold and above threshold conduction size uh, conduction as it relates to device size and ultimately device capacitance. So what I'd like to do first is draw a small signal model, or sorry, not a small signal model, but a cross-section diagram of what a MOSFET looks like. So in this, I'm gonna draw in red there, the gate of the uh, transistor. Underneath the gate, we have some gate dielectric, usually silicon dioxide, uh, or in more modern processes, it's some sort of high K dielectric, like a zirconium or a, um, something like that. Okay, so then, uh, then we uh, implant some, uh, implant regions here and plus regions within a P substrate as follows. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> as we um, model this, we, we understand from our previous discussions in the previous lecture that we have some intrinsic gate capacitance as part of this device here, right? Uh, and then this gate capacitance has a capacitive divider with the substrate. This here sets the uh, surface potential over here. Okay, so we definitely have some C ox uh, capacitance between the gate and the channel, uh, and as well as between the gate and the bulk. Okay, uh, in addition to that, we also have capacitance between the gate and the source, as well as capacitance between the gate and the drain. And then it turns out we also have capacitance across the PN junctions um, and, and so on and so forth. So if we go ahead and take this cross-section model and draw a actual circuit model. Uh, I'll draw it as an NMOS transistor uh, here to match the layout there. Then if this is the gate, drain, and source, basically what ends up happening is we have capacitance between every possible terminal. That's CGD, CGS. Uh, if I draw the connection to the bulk terminal here, we have CBS, uh, I'm sorry, CGB, should be the correct 
thing here, CGB. Um, and then from drain to bulk, we have some capacitance, CDB. And then um, this capacitor here is CBS. And then this is the bulk terminal. Okay, so we basically have capacitance between every possible uh, terminal of our MOSFET device. Uh, and all of these are actually fairly important. Okay, now we don't have time in this class to go over and derive exactly uh, what all these capacitors uh, look like and how they behave over voltage and so on. So I'm going to just say C other IC classes or books, if you're not taking any other IC classes, for derivations. Okay, in this class, we will use the following model and table. Okay, so what's this gonna look like is we're gonna have our model, uh, VG is here. We have some capacitance between the gate and uh, the bulk, so this is, sorry, that should be a capacitor, CGB, and this is VB. Uh, we have some capacitance between the gate and the source, this is CGS. We have capacitance between the gate and the drain, that is CGD. Uh, and then we have our usual dependent generators here, GM, VGS, GMB, VBS, R0, that is VD here, and VS down over here. Okay, um, so uh, that is the circuit diagram um, that we uh, will be using for this course. And then we'll use the following table that uh, describes under what mode of operation, how much capacitance uh, we're going to want to include. So CGS, CGD, and CGB, okay? So when we are in the subthreshold region of operation, we say that the channel is not well inverted and so therefore is not really a conductor. And so we don't have, uh, or so effectively all of our oxide capacitance is seen from the gate to the bulk. Okay, so we have Cox, W times L times one minus one over N or one minus Kappa. Okay, where C O L um, or, or I'm sorry, and then the, the C G S and C D S or C G D rather are uh, dictated by the overlap capacitance where C O L is equal to the overlap uh, capacitance which is really just uh, uh, caused by the fact that the gate has a finite overlap over the source and drain regions uh, of the transistor itself. Um, and this is uh, modeled by C aux times W times L overlap, where LOV um, can be described by the following uh, picture here. So if this is the implant region here and plus, we have our gate dielectric going this way. We have a gate on top of here. So we say that this dimension here is LOV. Okay, so that's just the overlap of the gate uh, over that uh, N plus region uh, in, a, in an NMOS transistor. Okay, uh, and then in above threshold, uh, we have two regions of operation. We have the triode region of operation. Uh, what we say here is that in triode, the channel is inverted, and so we do have conduction there. So we get one half WL times C aux. Basically, half of the gate capacitance is present there, plus the overlap capacitance is always going to be there. Um, CGD gets the other half, WL C aux plus C O L. And we say that in triode, the, the CGB capacitance is relatively small. Okay, it's not zero, 
uh, but it's uh, relatively small, right? Um, compared to the CGS and CGD capacitance anyways. And in saturation, noting that these two are for above threshold, in saturation, because of channel pinch off conditions, what we say is that the CGD capacitance is actually fairly small. And in fact, we say that most of the oxide capacitance, that's the OL, ends up going to CGS, uh, but not all of it because of the channel pinch off condition. And, and so to first order approximation, we say that um, the uh, uh, capacitance on CGS is two thirds WL times CX, not one W times L. Uh, times Cox, um, just to account for that channel pinch off condition. And then finally, the CGB uh, we say is uh, relatively small. Okay, so um, not discussed in, in these uh, formulas is the fact that we have junction capacitance between, um, you know, the, the source and the bulk and the drain and the bulk and so on. Uh, we're, you know, just for simplicity, not going to include uh, that in our calculations in this class. Uh, and in addition, I should mention that all of these uh, formulas uh, here are approximations uh, and, and, and they should only be used for first order hand pass analysis. All of these depend on voltages and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it, it is important to, to, to keep that in mind. All right, so now that we've done all that uh, work, kind of just building up some definitions and making sure we understand uh, uh, the, the subthreshold formulas and capacitance and so on, now we can get to the, uh, the main topic we're building up to, and that is CMOS building blocks. So now that we have better familiar, familiarity with the uh, subthreshold formula, we want to go ahead and uh, analyze and, and investigate some of these basic building blocks that, that we might want to, to use uh, as part of our basic analog uh, design library of, 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 of devices. So um, the most basic uh, building blocks that, that we will discuss uh, will be amplifiers. Uh, and specifically, we're going to start with the common source amplifier. So those of you who have taken a lot of circuits classes, you know, know common source amplifiers very well and so on. Uh, let's just go ahead and, and draw this out here. Uh, we have some AC input uh, voltage on top of a DC input voltage. That's V capital N and lowercase vn. Uh, maybe there's some source impedance associated here uh, with this source. Then we have our NMOS transistor. The source here is grounded. And in this particular case, we're going to resistively load the amplifier. Uh, and this is what we're going to call V out. Okay. So again, those of you who have done uh, a lot of circuits classes know the circuit very well. Uh, we're going to analyze this uh, primarily in the subthreshold region of operation. But to do that, we take the same steps that we always take, and that is we draw a small signal model to, to figure out things like the gain or the input impedance and, and so on. Uh, in this case, the small signal model has some input impedance. Uh, we'll just call that R in here. Uh, we're going to include the CGS capacitance in this particular analysis. Uh, for this particular analysis, we're going to ignore CGD. As you may know, CGD makes things just a little bit more difficult. We have GM VGS. Because the bulk is connected to ground in this case, I didn't draw it, but uh, when we don't draw it, we assume for NMOS transistors, it's connected to ground. For PMOS transistors, if we don't draw it, we assume it's connected to VDD. Uh, and that's V out. Okay. So that's the small signal model, uh, just using our uh, definition uh, that we had um, uh, written down earlier uh, for the capacitance model. Okay, so in this analysis, we're going to ignore CGD and then subsequently assume that RL in parallel with R0 is approximately equal to R0. We don't have to make these assumptions uh, just for the purposes of this uh, analysis that we're doing right now. We'll, we'll just make it just to uh, make things a little easier. Okay, so uh, within this uh, small signal model, uh, the important voltage that we want to figure out here is, is there. That's the VGS voltage. Uh, we can just go ahead and directly write that down. 
VGS is just a uh, impedance divider. It's one over S CGS over one over S CGS. If my tablet will allow me to write here, S CGS, having some issues here. I don't know what's going on. S CGS, there we go, plus R in. Uh, which was, if we simplify, that's just equal to 1 over 1 plus S RN CGS times VN. And I'm sorry, this should be times VN over here as well. Okay, um, so that is the expression for VGS. Uh, we know at the output here, V out is just equal to minus GM times R naught times VGS. Uh, now we know already know what uh, VGS is, so we can just directly substitute that in, and we get minus GM or not one over one plus S R N CGS times V N. Okay, so what this uh, shows here is that, and of course I don't know, my tablet is not showing that up. There we go. What this shows is that um, we have a gain, a, a DC gain here um, of uh, GMRO. Okay, so we'll call this the transfer function H of S. Okay, there we go. Okay, so given that uh, derivation of, of H of S, we can now go ahead and compute a few various metrics that might be of interest to this particular amplifier. Uh, first of all, we say that the DC gain, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, A sub V is just equal to minus GM R naught. Okay, so that's a, a very uh, familiar uh, derivation to you. Uh, we can say that the uh, bandwidth uh, in this particular case is equal to 1 over 2 pi times 1 over R in CGS. Um, now note that we didn't include any load capacitance in reality. Often, the bandwidth is often uh, limited depending on what you're driving and how the amplifier is designed and so on, uh, but often limited by the load capacitance, not necessarily the input uh, network, uh, but in this particular case we didn't have any load capacitance, so th this is what we get. Power is equal to, well, it's just VDD times the drain to source current. Uh, there's another metric we might want to investigate, uh, FT, uh, that is uh, basically a metric of the maximum frequency at which the current gain of the transistor is, is greater or is equal to one. Um, that's something that, you know, we could analyze. Uh, we don't really have time in this, in, in this course. Uh, they do analyze it uh, heavily in the um, RF uh, series of courses. So if you're interested in that, um, uh, take a look. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is uh, investigate this uh, DC gain a little bit more carefully in the subthreshold and above threshold regions of operation, knowing that uh, the transconductance is different in either of these regions. So I want, what I want to do is we'll start with subthreshold, and first I want to do the analysis for R0 being much less than RL. Okay, so in other words, it dominates the gain as we uh, effectively showed uh, 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 earlier. So in this situation, we say that the gain is minus GM R naught. Uh, we know what GM is in subthreshold. It's just IDS over N phi T. We also know what R naught is. Um, it's the same thing in above and subthreshold. It's one over lambda IDS. Okay, so that means the DC gain of the amplifier in subthreshold is equal to minus one N phi T lambda. Okay, this is a really interesting result uh, because this is not controlled by the designer in any way. So that's a really surprising result. If you are operating in subthreshold and the condition that R0 is less than the load impedance that, that, that you're loading the circuit with, you as the designer cannot control the gain to first order. 
Okay, that's a surprising result. You know, normally we think that, okay, we should increase the current, that increases the transconductance, and therefore that increases the gain. And yes, that does increase the transconductance, but it also serves to subtly affect R0 and reduce it, and so it's a wash, and so you don't get any increase in gain. Now, again, these are just first-order equations. Um, the transconductance formula is actually pretty accurate. Um, well, I mean, it's you know the 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 the, the definition is the derivative, and and the, the subthreshold formula itself is fairly accurate. The R0 formula is more empirical. Um, it, it's, it's less of an accurate formula uh, when we go ahead and model things more carefully, but to a first order, this is uh, certainly true. Okay, so now let's go ahead and analyze the other case for RL much less than R0. So let's say we end up having a, a load impedance uh, or load resistance that is um, much less than the intrinsic internal resistance of the amplifier. So then our gain is minus GM times RL, which is equal to minus IDS over N phi T uh, in subthreshold times RL. Okay, so this is normally what we more expect. Okay, so the gain will increase when the drain to source current in our transistor will increase. Okay, so that is only true if that uh, load resistance is indeed much less than the internal uh, resistance of the MOSFET. Okay, let's go ahead and now analyze the same circuit but in above threshold. Okay, um, so in this case, uh, we're going to just assume the, 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 the usual case uh, minus GM R0, we're assuming that R0 is less than the load impedance. So we can go ahead and substitute in uh, the transconductance formula. That's square root of 2 IDS mu C ox over N times W over L. Uh, multiply all of that by 1 over lambda IDS. So that part of the formula hasn't changed. So this is equal to minus 1 over lambda times 1 over root IDS times the square root of 2 mu C ox over N times W over L. Okay, so what this says is that we can increase gain in our above threshold transistor by decreasing current. and increasing W, okay? So that's actually the way that we take a transistor from above threshold into the subthreshold region of operation. So in other words, what this formula says, if you, if you want to have better gain in your transistor when RL, or sorry, when R0 is less than RL, then the best way to do it in above threshold is to go to subthreshold. <laughs> um, so that again emphasizes the fact that the subthreshold region of operation is a, a, a more uh, efficient uh, use of the transistor. Uh, and if you can uh, operate the, tra the transistor in subthreshold, you do have the benefits of increased uh, effective gain. Um, now, of course, as we mentioned earlier, this does come as a trade off in the sense that the um, device size will get larger, which means that the uh, capacitance will be larger and therefore the, the, the frequency response of the transistor might be a, a little slower.